open your Bibles to Romans, the fourth chapter. We're looking at verses 1 through 5 in our study on justification by faith. Justification by faith. I felt it was appropriate, having done a study on Elijah and what God had sent Elijah to do with the, the northern kingdom of Israel to bring a spiritual awakening and a reformation Justification by faith was an enormous uh, doctrine of the Reformation that led for a great sweep of the gospel across Europe and into what we now call America. And Romans, the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter is what lit a fire in Martin Luther that led to a spiritual reformation, justification by faith. Uh, today is our second lesson. We began in the chapter 4 last week. We, we introduced the subject matter out of the fifth chapter, verse 1. Today we're looking at the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter, as we'll see in a moment, Paul divided the fourth chapter into three sections. At least that's what I see, at least. He talked about Abraham's justification by faith, and he talked about David's justification by faith, and he extends it to the Christian church, justification by faith. And the point that he's making in chapter 4 is justification by faith without works of the law. And he's been pounding that since the third chapter, 18, and has extended that in. I didn't start with the middle of the third chapter uh, because we'll talk so much about it in reference back to it. But here's what he says in the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5. What shall we say? What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found. Now, remember that Paul is speaking to the Roman church, which is primarily Gentile. He's not talking to a Jewish church. He's talking to a Roman church. He's talking to a church in Rome. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather... And that's because of the covenant given to him. That word forefather is going to carry. He's our forefather because of the Abrahamic covenant. It's a grace covenant. Abraham lived before Moses and the law. What shall we say? What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Question. That's a rhetorical question. See the question mark? That's a rhetorical question. And it goes with... Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. That's verse 1 and 2, working with a rhetorical question. You see that? Be sure you get that. Now, in verse 3, he introduces another rhetorical question. So we have two that separate verses 1 and 2. 3, 4, and 5. For if, that's first class condition, it's used hypothetically. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Question mark. What does the scripture say? And he gives a quote. If you have a study Bible, you, you'll see that he's talking about um, uh, Genesis 15. Six, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or credited to him as righteousness. And then he goes on to explain. Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned, credited as favor. That is God's viewpoint of grace. When you have the word favor, it carries the idea of 
the God side of grace. Favor bestowed. It's the grace side. Man, man receives the grace part. God bestows favor and man receives grace. It's karen of kares. If ever, let's see, for, uh, now to the one who works his wage is reckoned or credited as favor uh, is not reckoned as favor, but what is due. In other words, you work, you get wages. But to the one who does not work, watch this now, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned or credited as righteousness. And notice, that's a gift. That's a positional truth. That's imputed righteousness. That comes with the moment of salvation, part of that package of 50 things. That's a very, very important, and, and he's asked us two rhetorical questions in that passage on justification by faith, and he's made a point, hasn't he? So what's the point he's made? You are justified. If you have justified last week, we said, if you have justified by faith, you have peace with God. That's Romans 5.1. Today, he says, if you've been justified by faith, that is in the gospel, acquitted from Adam's sin, justification by faith in the gospel is acqu acquittal of all Adam's sin. Today, he says that you get righteousness. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, that is the gospel. The person that believes that, according to Romans 1.16, the, the person that believes that receives grace salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The, the gospel is the power of God that saves you when you believe it. We saw in last week's lesson that one of the one of the one of the gifts of salvation that you get from justification, having acquittal of Adam's sin, the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, acquitted at the moment you believe, you have what replaces it. You have what replaces it. And we saw last week that what what was in place of the unbeliever's life before he was saved, alienation, enmity, hostility, etc. Not necessarily in the way you viewed God, because you could have been very religious. I said last time, both nations that hung him on the cross claimed to be religious. One was polytheistic and the other was monotheistic and they were both wrong. And the way they were wrong because they both rejected the gospel as the only source to, the, to a relationship with God. No man can come to the Father except through me, Jesus said in John 14, 6. So what he's saying here <laughs> is that what you receive at the moment of salvation, when you are justified by faith, you believe the gospel and you're acquitted of the 13 judicial, acquitted of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. You know, alienation, blind, cursed, condemned, at, at enmity with God, uh, darkness, death, the natural man perishing, unrighteousness, un, ungodly, under the wrath of God. Those 13 judicial charges, pff, gone. Acquitted. The moment you believe the gospel, you see, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says that in, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. In the, 40, in the same chapter 15, in verse 45, he calls the first Adam where our sin came from, the first Adam, and he calls the redeemer of, from that sin, he calls him the last Adam. So justification is a wonderful thing. It's, it's one of the nine things you receive through the blood of Christ at the moment of salvation. And when you get it, certain things come to you. Justification brings you with peace with God. Today we've learned that justification by faith in the gospel brings you righteousness from God. Here's a verse for you to write down. Here's a verse for you, a verse you should memorize. 
this would be a great memory verse for you. 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Did discussing Jesus, he who knew no sin, Jesus who knew had no relationship identity with sin, became sin, had identity on the cross. He who knew no sin came to no sin identity with sin on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins. Right? That, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Made righteous. That's a gift. We don't make ourselves righteous. He makes us righteous. It's called positional truth in theology. It's a position you receive at salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. Part of that package of 50 things. You can never lose this in time nor return because it's a gift from the grace of God. And it looks at the other side. The other side in Adamic sin, thir one of the 13, 13 judicial charges is that all men are born unrighteous. And religion can't fix it. Good works can't fix it. No works can fix it. It takes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to fix it. And, it. and it takes you believing in that gospel for it to be fixed in your life. It won't be fixed in your life because you sit in church. It'll be fixed because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ for your salvation. And then when you do, it's, it's Christmas in your life. He, he's going to give you all these things He's going to give you peace with God. That's his viewpoint on you. You remember that? That's the way God views you. And he always views you in Christ at peace with him because of the blood shed on your behalf. Same with righteousness. Righteousness, justification, when justification by faith is mentioned and righteousness is a gift, it's God's view of you. He always sees you as, as righteous, no matter how you think or behave. If you, are be if you have been born again from a divine <laughs> viewpoint, he always sees you as righteous. Because of he who knew no sin became sin for us, we were made the righteousness of God in him. It's a wonderful gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving and never run dry. You are always, always, always never let the devil lie to you. He's the biggest liar you'll ever meet in this world next to yourself. It is the lies you tell yourself that are the worst. And it doesn't matter if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ you are positionally, from a divine viewpoint, God always sees you as righteous. The penalty of your sin has been paid for. It's no longer an issue in salvation. It's an issue in sanctification. It's a, it, it, your sin is an issue in the minute indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Oh, if I could get you to understand this, it will so revolutionize your life. You spend way too much time on pity parties in your own life. You throw way too many. You got to stop that. You have more to boast about in God than, than, than to tear down yourself. Every time you start picking on yourself, you need to start boasting about what God has done for you because you've become too, way too self-centered. And when you do that, get back to being Christ-centered. Go back and think about what Christ has provided for you to be a completely different person than even you think you are. 
listen, you've been justified. You've been sanctified. You've been, you know. You need to go back and look at those nine things that the blood of Christ, that's your new identity. The 20 things of what you receive. Well, let's take a look at five things this morning. <clears throat> Abraham's justification by faith. First of all, I want to be able to break down chapter 4 for you as I see it and the way I'll teach it. Abraham's justified justification by faith, not by works of the law. That's 1 through 5. Fourth chapter, 6 through 12. David's justification by faith, not by works of the law. See, he, this is going to be a the theme of chapter 4 when you read it. Fourth chapter, 13 through 25. The church age believers, such as you and I, our justification by faith, not by works of the law. Nobody is justified by works of the law. Nobody. <clears throat> look, at, look at the third chapter, verse 24. <clears throat> Romans 3.24. Now, in verse 23, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all, 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 all. That's why we're sinners. Now watch verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. See that? That's really important. You understand it because justification, when you believe the gospel of Christ, you, you're under justification by faith because you believe the gospel. And when you are, that justification has acquitted all 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin against you. You're acquitted. You're acquitted of all Adam's sin. You're acquitted. That's the word redemption. You've been purchased from the slave market of Adam's sin. Eh? That too is one of the nine works of the blood of Christ upon your life when you believe. Now when we get to when we get to our, our passage, that's Romans 4, 1 through 5, it should be divided in two ideas based on rhetorical questions. <clears throat> one in, verses 1 and 2 and verses 3 and 4. What did Abraham, the founder of the Jewish race, discover about his own great salvation? Notice that Paul call, he gives three F words. Forefather, Flesh and found. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? See that in verse 1? For if first class condition is true and it's used hypothetically, if this is true, this is true. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Because he's worked, he's get wages, he gets what's due. But see, justification by faith is a gift. It's salvation, it's part of the salvation gift idea. So it, it would be important for you uh, to identify all that. I put a lot of that on your paper for you. In verses 3 and 4, he comes back to a rhetorical question. What did Abraham discover from the old covenant canon of scripture? Notice what he says. What does the scripture say? Now, when Paul is pinning this in Romans, we don't have a completed canon called a Bible. We only have half a book. We have the old covenant canon called the Old Testament. The New Testament, it, when Romans is written, is being written. So when he, refers, when he refers back to the scriptures, he's referring back to the old covenant, and so he quotes it. He, co he quotes the Abrahamic covenant. If you want to study the Abrahamic covenant, you should, because he's your forefather. It was a grace covenant. You, you're, you have to study Genesis 12 through 15, and when you do, you get a chance to look at the Abrahamic covenant, an enormous covenant. It trumps the Mosaic law. When you read the book of Galatians, you always read Romans and Galatians together because Paul really gets after uh, the law. 
You're never justified by the law. You're justified by faith apart from the law. The law has been sent, Galatians tells you in the third chapter that the law has been sent uh, to condemn you and point you to Christ. Somebody who can redeem you from the slave market of Adam's sin. Well, so it's, it's it, it, the scripture that he says here, what does the scripture say? And then he's going to give you an example of it. He's going to quote Genesis 15, 6. Abraham found, uh, Paul says that Abraham found, at least Paul found Abraham's answer in justification by faith, not law. Abraham was born before the law. So how did Abraham get saved? Well, well, let's go to the book of Galatians. Because it is in the book of Galatians that he tells you how you got saved. So let's go to the third chapter, verse 18, uh, 8. Galatians 3.8. Remember Romans and Galatians, two books that go together, and they don't contradict each other, and if they do, you're misreading them. 3.8. The scriptures, the scriptures, that's Old Covenant, the scriptures foreseen, that's prophetic, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. When he preached the gospel to Abraham, he wasn't a Jew, he was a Gentile. Abraham wasn't born a Jew, he was reborn a Jew of the Jewish race. That's the Abrahamic covenant, the blessed seed, uh, the blessing, and the land, Abrahamic covenant. How was Abraham saved? By a prophetic gospel. Beforehand, before Christ came and died on the cross of Golgotha, the hill called Golgotha, with a date and a time and a place when Christ died on that cross. This is the prophetic look, foreseen, beforehand. Those are words out of the Old Covenant idea. How were people saved in the Old Testament? They were saved by believing that Jesus would one day come, that Christ would come. He would die on a cross for the sins of humanity from Adam and would be buried and raised from the dead the third day. He believed it was saved. He was, when he believed, listen to me now, when he, this is Paul's argument, not mine. I'm agreeing with Paul. That when he believed it, he was justified by faith. That's our subject matter. Abraham was justified by faith, not works of the law. That's what, Paul discovered, Abraham discovered, and Martin Luther discovered what they discovered, and I discovered what the rest of them discovered. <laughs> when I went through my seminary training, I had to study Martin Luther in German. And the only thing I remember is Sprechen Sie Dutch. If you don't use it, you lose it. But I remember reading that whole, the whole history in German of Martin Luther. That's what I had to study. I lived in a weird day of theology, I can tell you that. Thank God for the computer that came along, and you don't have to do that anymore. They translated every bit of it into English. Well, anyhow, we're thankful for the Bible, aren't we? Point number two. Point number two, Paul says that Abraham learned that God justifies the ungodly. Now think of that word. Think of that word. He, I lost Romans. I, give me a moment. Get back to fourth chapter of Romans. Verse five, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. 
You know what one of the 13 judicial charges against man is? Ungodly. Ungodly. It's not how you think. It's not how you behave. You're ungodly in Adam. And you're godly in Christ. You're ungodly. You say, well, Ron, I wasn't ungodly. I was a good person. Yeah, I know. You were, you were an Adam. See, he took into account what all mankind would be. In Adam, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is Christ. We have all fallen short. You didn't realize how far short you were until you read the 13 judicial charges against you. Not because you've broke any of them, it's because you're an Adam. We're all born in Adam. You got to be reborn in Christ. Paul says that Adam learned, Adam learned, as Paul learned, that Martin Luther learned, that Ron Adama learned, that God justifies the ungodly. Notice this word. It has an A on the front of it and then an S-E-B-E-S, Sabus, a Sabus. That A on the front is called an alva privative. It means without. And Sebus means a reverence for God, a, 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 a deep respect. We're born without it. And even when you finally get to it, that you have a sense of God consciousness and a reverence for him, don't mean you're saved. It means you have the likelihood of being saved because if you're God conscious in a positive way, then he's obligated himself, Romans, the first chapter, to give you a gospel hearing so that you can enter into the magnificent grace plan of God. God has looked at every niche and, cr and corner of the possibilities and impossibilities to make it sure that you could be saved, every person in the human race, could be saved, and he came up with by faith through grace and not of yourself, it is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Nobody could outthink the plan that God has for us. What we have to think is think in it, not away from it. And so what a wonderful idea that Paul discovered that Abraham learned. Now, let me tell you, he learned it experientially. You know why? Well, Look down under point two, Joshua 24, 4. Who is this man, Abraham, that everybody calls the father of the Jewish race? Who was he? Was he always the father of the, of the Jewish race? Oh, no, 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 no. He was an older man. He was in his 70s. It's not as old as I used to think it was. It was in his 70s. And his life just began. His life just began. He got born again, got born again into the plan of God and became a father at that age and later in life still was having kids. His ministry just began. Think about that. Most of you are ready to close the book on your life. Oh, my goodness, I'm 65. I think I'll just uh, close the book. Listen, he'll close the book on your life. Don't worry about it. He'll close the book. Now, here's what he discovered. Joshua said to the people, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times, your fathers, plural, lived beyond the river, name, namely the men, Terah. He was the father of Abraham, and he was the father of Nahor. 
They, watch this now, they served other gods. They came from the Ur of the Chaldeans, a paganistic, polytheistic society. Who was this Abraham? If you look at the genealogy of Jesus, he was born again as an older man and became the father of Jewish race because he had children. You know the Sarah story. He's 100 and she's 99 and they're having babies. <laughs> well, anyhow. Who was this Abraham before he became this older man called from the Ur of the Chaldeans to the Abrahamic covenant of a new land and people and seed of Christ? Who was he? He was a Shemite. He was a Shemite. Who were the Shemites? Noah, when he docked his boat and got off, he had three sons. One of those three sons was Shem. Shem became the the seed of Christ to Abraham. That's, he was the last Shemite and the first Jew. And he was an old man. Based, based on life expectancy. Now he's going to, God is going to double his years. Something you couldn't do, and I can't do, but God can. And what he missed in the first 75 years, God gave him in the second half. Listen, your life without Christ is a big fat zero. Your life really begins when you get born again and get in the plan of God. And the plan of God gets in you. Now God does something with your life that's significantly important, not only to you and your family, but to the world around you. My, my people, all of your best days are ahead of you. Don't listen to all this foolishness about this COVID stuff. It's God sent it to, to bring a spiritual awakening, to bring a reformation. Our nation is a mess. And it's a mess. Listen, it's been a mess in my lifetime because they threw God under the bus. They took him out of the social discussion of America. And the church allowed it. Church has got to be awakened and put him back, put him back into the discussion of everyday talk in America. You know, when you get to hear about God on television, it's a paid announcement. Nobody volunteers it. You're not going to find it on the news unless they're running people through to get a vaccination or a, or a test or something. It doesn't give you any identity of who God is. And it doesn't tell you anything about the people other than they're good and they open up their facilities to help people. Oh, my like, jeez. Let me tell you who's going to drag this thing out. Let me tell you who's going to drag it out. I mean to the last. The devil. The only guy that's getting anything out of this is the devil. And the only people that are dying are those who are on schedule to die. She whiz. We carry a Bible and don't read it. Now, I know I'm talking to the choir, but that's all I got here. Okay? I gave you a bunch of verses while you read. Romans, the fourth chapter, the fifth chapter, verse 6. 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11. You want to know more about this ungodly people? There you go. 2 Peter 2, 5 and 6. Listen, we're all ungodly. You were ungodly. I was ungodly. It's part of the package of Adam's sin. 
The problem is when you act it out, then you make the rest of us really nervous. Except we're, we've become an ungodly nation, and the church is not even upset with it. Jeez. I am. And I just take my platform and holler it. That's all I got is a platform, and that's enough. Well, Joshua, who was Joshua talking about? Abraham, who was Abraham? It was a Shemite. You ought to read the genealogy of Matthew 1 and Luke 3, and you'll see it. The Messianic seed of Christ moved from the Shemites to the Israelites through Adam. Romans 4, 5. But to the one who does not work, and he used the strong negative in the Greek language, ook, the only way that gets stronger is to go ook me. <laughs> When you have ook, let me tell you what ook is. No! That's an ook. You ever get that at home? School teacher, somebody? Well, that, they're right on the verge of panicking. Only thing worse than that is an ook, may, and that would be the sirens going off in the Greek language. The one who does, I'm sorry, I, I found a Dave Wisenat sitting on the front row up here. When I holler, she jumps, and Dave used to do it. Uh, I should have never noticed that. I'll try to control myself. Notice there's a definite article with ergozoi, present middle participle dative, singular masculine, that's dative of disadvantage. Contrast. Notice this, the contrast, not by works, but believe. See, that's pastuo. That's, I didn't put it down, but it's a present active participle, dative, singular, mass, it's a present passive participle. Those two participles are working together. One is negative and one is positive. That's why the day is a contrast. Believes in him who justifies. Notice justifies a present active participle. We have a string of events. The ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness, his faith is credited as righteousness. Let's take a look at point three. Paul declared that in order for Abraham to be justified by faith, Abraham had to believe what God said specifically about grace salvation apart from works. Okay? We read Galatians 3.8, how Abraham got saved. That's very important. What Abraham believed was 1 Corinthians 15.3 and 4, Romans 1.16, Ephesians 2.8.9, before it happened to the church until Jesus Christ actually came and died on a cross. It was prophetic. What did Abraham have to believe? He believed that one day Christ would come, die on a cross for the sins of humanity. He would be buried and raised on the third day. All taught in the Old Testament. Abraham had to believe that. He believed it prophetically. Foreseen. All right? What did the scripture say in Ephesians 4 3? Well, they quote Genesis 15 6. When he believed the Lord's when he believed in the Lord, uh, he 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 and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. That's where it came from. It came from Genesis 15, 3, uh, 6. Abraham believed God, and it, faith, was credited to him as righteous. The moment he believed the gospel, his faith was credited to righteousness. In other words, it was credited, and he got peace. It was credited, and he got righteousness. That's something that was a gift to you. That's how God views you. God always views you in Christ. Always views you in Christ as righteous and at peace with God. We have learned that so far in our studies. In Genesis 15, Abraham was promised a messianic seed heir. That is covered in Genesis 12 through chapters 4 uh, through 15. We call it the Abrahamic covenant. 
You should read Genesis 22, 38. And we looked at Romans 3, 24. Point number four. Hey, before I get there, I want to go to Galatians a moment with you. Would you go back to Galatians? Let's just slide back. Go through the Corinthians to Galatians. I, I want to show you something before I leave Abraham. And let me get through 2 Corinthians here. In Galatians 3, I want to go to 16. If you have a study Bible, you'll see that when, he, when Paul gets into Galatians 3, he's talking about faith, justification by faith brings righteousness. And in and, and verse 8, he talks about how Abraham was saved. In verse 6, even so Abraham believed God, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that, and then we got to verse 7 and 8. Now, slide down to verse 16. And, and Paul says, now, there are all kinds of covenants, but I'm talking about the covenants of grace. In verse 16, he says, now the promises, that's the promises of the covenant of grace. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. See, he's talking about the Abrahamic grace covenant. He does not say rather to one and to your seed, he does not say, and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. Isn't that interesting? Now, it's going to go through the descendants of Abraham like the stars of heaven until we get, but it always has to come through the genetic code for Christ. And Matthew 1 and Luke 3 give you the genealogy. Uh, Matthew one genealogy goes from Abraham to Christ. Luke's goes from Adam to Christ. Well, it's, it's just stuff you should read. You should read. Um, but I wanted you to I wanted you to notice verse sixteen. Uh, specifically, make sure you have that on your paper. He, he, he's oh, when he talked to Abraham and he talked about the, 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 that his descendants would be like the stars of heaven. He's still talking about one seed that is important to history. And that is the coming of Christ. Do you see what I say? All right. It just, sometimes you have to put some things together. Um, Well, anyhow, point number four. Justification by faith results in the acquittal of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. Always remember that. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get justified by faith. Justified by faith is where you get acquittal of the 13 judicial charges. You get justification, redemption, reconciliation, etc. That's very important that you, that you get that. Because listen, one day you will learn, if you keep coming here, that the Greek word for righteousness and justification are the same. And they have the same root, daiki. And people really get them confused because they don't understand how they work. I've really explained the theology of it in really simple terms. If you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get justification, which is the acquittal of all the 13 judicial charges, and you receive peace with God. You receive uh, uh, righteousness, etc. And I can tell you, people really get confused about these two words, uh, and there's more confusion in theology, and there should not be. It's a very simple concept to understand if, you're, if you understand grace salvation. Justification by faith was, is what, where the package of 50 things that every believer receives in time and eternity that he can never lose. Now, let me ask you a couple questions. What was credited, Logimazo, what was credited in, in the fourth chapter, verse 3? What was credited? Righteousness, wasn't it? What was credited was righteousness. And we call that imputed righteousness because 
It comes when you believe the gospel is imputed. It's a positional truth. You didn't do anything to deserve that righteousness. It, it comes with 2 Corinthians 5.21. There, there is another question. How was it credited? Justification by faith. Agreed? How was it credited? Justification by faith. See, you need to really, when you read the Bible like this, you need to go back and look at it. Listen, listen. You do know that the Bible, you, you, you hear it, you believe it, you understand it. Then it comes to application time. He's going to test this information in your life because your life, your life must be lived by the power of the word of God. <clears throat> Logizomai, the word credited or in the King James reckoned, reckoned, Logizomai, the Greek word is Logizomai. It's used three times in my passage. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, here it is. It's used in verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5, isn't it? The word credited or reckoned. In verse 3, justification, it, and it teaches. It's, it's a teaching word. In verse 3, justification by faith is required to be credited with imputed righteousness. In verse 4, the imputation of righteousness is by grace which is described as favor, that's grace on the part of God. Favor bestowed. When you find this word, and, and you're going to find it, it's going to be spelled C-H-A-R-I-N. It, it, it is for grace. It's C-H-A-R-I-S. And it's used for favor when it's put in the, with the N on the end of it, it's put for favor. And it places what the other person is capable of seeing in the other person. Favor. It's favor bestowed. It's how God views. It's how God views you. That you're favored. Listen, every moment of your life after you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, every moment of your life from God's viewpoint, you are favored in him. You are fav you're a favorite. Don't let people pick on you and tear, tear you down. You're not what other people say you are. You're what God says you are. You need to know what, how God views your life. That word favor is a magnificent word. It would do us well to all have it in our life with dealing with other people that we like or dislike. To show favor, to bestow favor is a product of grace. I don't see you as you are. I see you who your potential is in Christ. Can we not do that? That's how God does us. It's a magnificent idea. In verse 5, imputation of righteousness is credited because Jesus Christ's redemption acquits every person from the slave market of Adam's sin. In verse 5. It's a powerful verse. There's a, there's, a, a, there's a section of verses you need to read on your own. And I think I put it in bold print. You need to read Romans 3, 21 through 26. Not now, but later. Let me go to point five, and, and we'll close this down. The person who believes in a work salvation can never, you ought to circle word never, can never have something to boast about before God. Whether it be salvation or the Christian life. You don't get saved by works. You don't get favored by works. You get favored by grace. Favor, God's favor comes through grace.
I want you to do something with me because I know you're going, you've missed it. I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 2, 9. Because I'm all the time quoting this. And we miss it. Now, we, you, get, you get what I'm after. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift. Look at verse 9. You know what that says? Look at verse 9. Not as a result of works. Why? Why? So that no one can boast. Huh? You both have to go to God, wouldn't it? Because he saved you. Lock, stock, and barrel, as you used to say. I don't know who they were, but. That they were who I was around. Lock, stock, and barrel. Don't tell me after class because I know I've already had, I use that phrase a lot, and I've had people tell me what that means. So I know, but I still use it. Isn't that, isn't that marvelous? Right there in that wonderful grace passage, isn't that wonderful? See, that's what Paul said. If, if it's by works, then you, there, there will never be any boast before, when you stand before God, there'll be no boast about God. Whether? None. You got it all through your work. That's all you get. Well, when it's by grace, you'll have an eternity. Hello. Won't be temporal, be eternal. Work is temporal, in it? That's why you go to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Not before God. Don't buy into that foolishness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not, not credited as favor, but as what is due. See, you always want... Grace will always show favor. Favor is what you want. You understand what I mean? Favor is what God bestows on the grace of your life. Favor. You couldn't work and earn it. Your kids shouldn't either. That's not how they should get your favor. They should get it from your grace. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited or reckoned as righteousness. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 30, 31. Where then is the boasting? Romans 3, 27, 28. Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No! But by the law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the law. Huh? What a great study this will be to your life. It ought to lead to you understanding how God favors you when he sees grace in your life. He favors you. You will get favors from God when you manifest grace in your life. It's a powerful idea. I hope we got it today. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray the Holy Spirit as he is declared to do, would teach and recall, disclose, guide, bring glory to Christ through our lives. I'm so thankful, Father, for these in attendance today who have weathered the storm setting where they should. I pray we would be bold in these days with the gospel of Jesus Christ, bold in the way we live without fear. We live by faith. 
not by sight. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.